Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's one thirty, so we are going to start uh, uh, now. We have a long uh, afternoon. Uh, before I introduce the uh, the workshop, I am Antoine Messiaen, the uh, coordinator of CITM. Um, I will uh, devote to uh, our ministries of agriculture and uh, environment. First is environment, ecology. Yeah. Anne-Sophie Carpentier will introduce, and then Marion Bardi from uh, agriculture. Thank you. So, good afternoon. On behalf of the French Ministry for the Ecological and Solidary Transition, I have the pleasure of welcoming you in Paris for this CIPM workshop on the projects funded under the first and second calls of CIPM. I'm Anne-Sophie Carpentier, one of the coordinators of the research and innovation access of the national plan to reduce the use of pesticides on the, uh, and the health and environmental risks. In addition to the Ministry for an Ecological and Solidary Transition, the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Health, and the Ministry of Research coordinate this access. Several studies in Europe show a significant loss of biodiversity, which is a major concern for us. As you know, scientific results have shown impact of pesticides on environment and human health. That's why the French Ecofoto Plan has the target to reduce by half pesticide use by the year of 2025, which is a major challenge. Our agriculture needs solution to decrease farms' dependency on pesticides and to become more environmental friendly and remain competitive. And to address this challenge, we need to design integrated agroecological systems. Farmers need to be brought into the innovation process because system changes are being required of them. This issue is the same for every European country. Although special attention is paid to uptake of existing solutions, research has a crucial role to create systems for reducing reliance on pesticides. This year, the French government has decided to double the research budget of the Ecofito plan to 8 million of euros. Several calls for, object, for projects have been lastly launched, such as one on the territorial drivers to reduce the use of pesticides. Indeed, we think that acting at the landscape and territorial scale can help us to increase the resilience of agroecosystems to pests. And by this way, we can reduce the use of pesticides and the impacts on pesticides on human health and biodiversity. We introduce in the National Ecofito Call a research access to help the transition and a call to mature research project will be launched in January on biocontrol and decision support systems. A collective science advice study has also been launched on the health risks and to meet this major challenge, the over French research funds are also mobilized. However, a concerted effort at the international level is needed. Europe is the good scale as borders don't stop pests. To speed up the implementation of integrated pest management, one can learn from experiences and research carried out across Europe. And confunding transnational research can also speed up the process. That's why European research on integrated pest management has a major role to play, to structure research community, and to contribute to the development of integrated solutions. This needs an overall movement putting together economy, ecology, health, and social science, biology, and agronomy. And CIPM is not the only program dealing with IPM-related research, but the projects funded here were directly linked to the research agenda that was discussed and defined together. So I'm very looking forward to discussing your first results and I wish you a very good workshop. 
Thank you for your intention and your personal involvement in the field. So, uh, good afternoon. Uh, so, I'm Marion Bardi from the French Ministry for Agriculture and Food. Um, some of you may know my colleague Gérard Gauthier-Amont, who was involved in the CIPM consortium. Uh, he's just retired and he's very sorry because he really enjoyed the <laughs> CIPM meetings, but he won't be here uh, today and I'm taking over the, um, the subjects. So, um, of course, I'm also very happy to welcome you in Paris for this workshop. Um, Anne-Sophie has already described the uh, overall national uh, context regarding the eco-phyto um, plan. So I won't come back to it now, especially because I will tell you uh, also a, a bit more about this uh, tomorrow in the afternoon. So for now, I won't be long, but I just wanted to add a few words regarding the European dimension. Um, as you certainly know, the framework Program number nine, uh, which is called Horizon Europe, is under discussion. So the Commission proposed a cluster named Food and Natural uh, Resources for this program with a budget of 10 billion euros. So um, we see it as a great opportunity to accelerate the transition of European food and uh, agriculture towards uh, agroecological approaches. At the French level, um, the ministry we, is um, strongly supportive of uh, these approaches and uh, integrated pest management, of course, is, is one of the key uh, issues to, uh, to achieve this. So this meeting will be a um, very good opportunity to take note of what, have, what has been done, to discuss it, and to assess to what extent the strategic research agenda has been covered um, but I think that this meeting with, will also help us to contribute to the discussions um, that are going on regarding Horizon Europe in order to design the food and natural resources cluster, which means that we need to identify what are the remaining and the new research questions that we have to address at the European level. And it should also, I think, contribute to um, the design, uh, to the reflections on the design of the future partnerships and of the potential missions within um, FP9. So, um, having said that, uh, I, I wanted to take the opportunity to thank the organizers of the meeting, especially uh, Antoine and uh, Laure, <laughs> and uh, to wish us all, of course, a very fruitful meeting. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, uh, Anne Sophie uh, and Marion. Um, so are we? Laure, is it? Ah, okay. So, yeah, it works. So just um, before we, uh, we get to the, uh, the core of this uh, workshop, uh, a, few word about, a few words about the, the background. Most of you have been involved in CIPM, but maybe not uh, all of you. And um, so a short uh, background and, uh, and uh, some ideas about the, the objectives of this uh, workshop were already touched upon by uh, uh, Marion. So just to, to remind you, so CIPM was an internet that uh, was uh, funded by the EC between 2014 and 2016. Three years involving quite a lot of people, so 34 partners. Uh, partners were either funders or managers of research managers and uh, across 21 countries. So most of the uh, EU were, were, was covered. And uh, the uh, initial objectives was, to, of course, as for any era net, it was to, to map research and to identify synergies and gap in the national uh, program in order to, to, to <coughs> fill in the gaps and uh, through the uh, 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 transnational calls. And of course, at the end of the day, the uh, final objective is not to, to launch call for calls, and that would be a key message for you uh, as speakers uh, today and tomorrow. To, to, to focus on the uh, use of research and the uh, translation of research into uh, practical implementations for, for farmers. Uh, and so one of the, 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 the rationale of the CPM was 
the keyword defragmentation. This is a huge challenge. As it was said by Anne-Sophie, pests ignores borders. So this is at least one, one of the reasons why we need to, uh, to work together and not to, to work with uh, everyone in this country. And of course we can also uh, share existing solutions and we can um, avoid redundancy <coughs> and, and, and gain by sharing and sharing funding as well, we can speed up the process. And um, so that was the, uh, the, the first uh, um, uh, purpose of differentiation. Disciplines, I will come back to it. So there is a lack of indices. So far, uh, IPM or crop protection has been very much focusing on one crop, one pest, one year. And, uh, and uh, to, 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 to move forward, we need to, to include more uh, disciplines and uh, including social economics as well. And of course, upscaling is a big issue. As I said, the challenge is to uh, move from this uh, yeah, one crop, one pest, one year, which has been, which is still uh, in, in most uh, uh, um, research is still the case. And so we have to upscale of the, of, the, of the space, so to consider the territory, and Sophie mentioned that there is a new call coming up, uh, coming up on the, uh, uh, the landscape uh, dimensions, how well the landscape management can help foster IPM and uh, reduce pesticide use. Of course, over time, through diversification, through rotation, but not just rotation, diversification, crop diversification at large, but also, and this is, has been uh, a main uh, issue, is to, uh, look also upscaling through the organization. It's not just uh, up to uh, the farm level uh, or the farmer level, but also to consider to what extent uh, the supply chains, the R&D organizations or institutional uh, bodies can be a kind of, uh, well, kind of locking the transitions towards um, IPMs or agroecology at large. So that was uh, behind the, the background of, uh, of CIPM. And so what we did, and uh, we to go through. So, one of the key outcomes is this uh, strategic research agenda. It was based on the mapping, as I said. Uh, it was based on the inputs from stakeholders. It's a big challenge, a huge challenge to, 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 to make people co contribute, but still, it, it there. it's there. It's a document, it's a li living document. And of course, at the end of the day, we have identified uh, R&D activities that should be further uh, developed. And that was the... Um, uh, the basis for uh, the, the two calls we have uh, uh, launched. The strategic research agenda, you've got the executive summary as well as some, uh, some um, of the, the, full, the full report on the strategic uh, uh, research agenda that are on the tables over there. And uh, identified, I won't go into details, just we had four core themes. Uh, one on the uh, pre pre preventive and um, preventive me measures, including also monitoring that we will touch upon in, in a while well, later the, today. Alternative to, to pesticide, of course, which is another um, priority of the directive on sustainable use of pesticides. Uh, minor crop, minor uses was identified as a key issue to, in, in, well, it's an issue as such, of course, minor uses, but the idea of in this in CIPR was to assess to what extent I, uh, IPM, integrated pest management, can help solve some of the issue of minor crops uh, beyond the, uh, uh, the strategy that is uh, mutual recognition and so, so on. And also driver impacts on, uh, of IPM. But this, this, this in, uh, uh, has not been uh, um, included in the, in the calls. And... Um, only the three, uh, the first, the first three uh, has been included in two calls. So in the first call, 2015, so we selected topics and subtopics and uh, another round of topics, more topics the second year. Uh, so no need to 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 to, to go through. Uh, just to give you a flavor, at the end of the day, we have 16 projects has been funded and will be presented today and tomorrow morning. And this is kind. You will get the, the summary. So of the, um, of the outcomes and the uh, selection pressure was better the second year. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, it's uh, around 12 million uh, that has been used, uh, provided by the uh, uh, funding countries. So some countries has put quite a lot, other less. It's, it's a challenge. This transnational course with national funding, it's, it's, it's an issue, but we did manage and, uh, but at, Overall, so 
project or 16 project will be presented. Of course, uh, and that's, they are there. So they are, uh, have been uh, structured th 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 this way. Uh, it is included in the uh, uh, leaflet you have received together with the uh, short report. Um, of course, as through two calls, we haven't covered the strategic research agenda because it's easy to say, okay, oh, it would be nice to, to have this kind of research and to, so to list a list of priorities, research is easy. But then when you launch calls, you get what you get. So the offer might not be. And we, we, we haven't been able to, well, this internet has been running for three years only. The projects were launched uh, in 2016 or 2017. And so we said with the executive summary that it would be uh, just a pity to stop end of 2016 and let projects uh, do their research to submit a report to funding bodies without discussing again. So the, 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 this um, uh, rationale to, to, to share results, it's, well, should, should continue after the, so that's what we decided to organize this workshop. And there would be another one at the end when once all, all projects will be finished in two years from now. And um, um, I forgot to mention, yeah, but it will be later. So the first objective, of course, is to share uh, results, discuss, and uh, so that projects could meet also uh, together, might give rise to uh, some synergy uh, between projects. We never know. That's at least uh, uh, something we, we, we do. Up. And uh, of course, there would be many, many aspects of a strategy that are not covered. So it would be good to, to spot those areas that has not been covered that will be still need to be supported. And, uh, and there might be other one because this strategic agenda is, was prepared in 2015 and you know that in this area, it's, everything is moving very fast. And, and therefore, as Marion just said, uh, this workshop should also be an opportunity to uh, discuss and identify uh, new, well, new or research challenges that could feed the process of Horizon Europe for the next 10 years. And uh, I forgot to mention but that as a follow-up of these uh, activities, we, are, uh, link up, we, we have linked up uh, with the new run, this broader run at Suscrop. Most of the funders of CIPN are also part of Suscrop and we will uh, say uh, somewhere tomorrow morning. I think that's all uh, for, for now. Uh, so please, speakers, so the idea is not to discuss scientific results and details. The audience is mostly users and funders and also scientists. So uh, I guess in the d discussion, we will try to focus on to what extent the results can, can help implementing IPM and, um, and also to what extent we can, uh, we can create synergies between, uh, between topics. So I would like now to uh, call, uh, so the first session, so we have four sessions plus one cross-cutting session tomorrow afternoon. Uh, the first session is on minor uses. And um, so your uh, museum from the um, minor crop uh, commodity um, secretariat, while well, you will introduce yourself, will be chairing uh, this session. And as a rapporteur, we have uh, Josef Kies, who was part of the uh, uh, executive committee. Thanks to, uh, to you two and to all chairs and rapporteurs, I won't say that again, for accepting to, to take this case. So the floor is yours. Uh, Okay, thank you, Antoine. My name is uh, Jeroen Meus, uh, and I'm the coordinator of the EU Minor Users Coordination Facility. Uh, just very briefly, what are minor users? Say minor use is, in fact, um, uh, the use of a plant protection product on a crop that is not widely grown. Or you can have crops that are widely grown, but to meet an exceptional plant protection need, for example, an invasive species in, uh, in corn or, or wheat. Um, the coordination facility uh, uh, was established in 2015. And the mission of the coordination facility is, of course, to solve minor use problems to look to chemical as well as non-chemical solutions within an IPM framework. And it was also mentioned when we were established 
that we should mandatory work together with CIPM ARANET. Say an important tool to solve minor users is uh, EMUDA, the EU Minor Users Database. And we did an inventory uh, to collect all the minor users needs from the different member states. And say the top priority was uh, or is carrot root fly in, in carrots. And I don't know if this is a coincidence, but the first presentation is dealing with this uh, major topic. Uh, it's integrated control of root feeding fly larvae infesting vegetable crops, and it will be presented by Rosemary Collier. Okay. So how does this work? Go just forward. Is that forward? To move forward is click this one. Yeah. Let's see it the other way around. Yeah, oh. pointer. Okay, so that's okay, forward. So are, yeah. Okay, right. So. Right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so, yeah, my name's Rosemary Collier. I'm from the University of Warwick, and I'm the coordinator um, for this project. Um, so I'm not going to go into sort of detail about anything, but I'm going to try and sort of explain what we've all been doing. Um, so there are nine parties, uh, nine partners in the consortium um, from eight countries. Um, we started in May 2017 and we finish in March 2020. Um, so the focus, obviously, from the title is on fly larvae that feed on roots, on roots of vegetable crops. Um, we're working on, on five species, four species of Delia and Scylla rosy, the carrot fly. Um, why are we working on them? Um, because together they affect um, a relatively large area of vegetable production. They're important crops that are affected. Um, at the moment, control relies mainly on insecticides. Um, some of the pests are difficult to control, even with insecticides, on certain crops. Um, there are various potential IPM tools, um, but very few are used currently. Um, and just to say that in some of the work packages, there has been a particular research focus on Delia radicum, the cabbage root fly. Um, so just an overview of the, the work packages. So there are five work packages. Um, so we start with one, um, which is concerned with decision support. Um, then number two is about manipulating um, behavior of the cabbage root fly. The third one is about biological control. Um, the fourth one is about building an IPM toolbox for these pests. Um, and the fifth one is about assimilation and dissemination of information on best practice. Um, so the first work package, decision support, then we've been looking at all the information and all the forecasting models that are available to us for the different pests. Um, so we have quite a lot of historical data, but we don't often have or so often have um, weather data to match with it. Um, there are a number of day degree forecasts and then two countries um, have produced simulation module models for some of the um, species. So the aim is to, to test those more, more widely. Um, model output doesn't always fit monitoring data. Um, and one sort of emerging issue is actually hot summers climate change, which appears to be affecting the, the phenology of some of the, the pests, particularly carrot fly. Um, in the UK, we're also trying to develop a forecast for Delia fatura, um, because one doesn't exist at the moment. Um, one sort of thing we're doing jointly within that work package is an experiment on Delia radicum. Um, Delia radicum has... Um, different biotypes that emerge at different types in times in the spring um, and what we're doing is collecting samples from the different countries um, and then looking at their emergence to see if different biotypes are present. Um, so we started doing that in, in 2017 uh, and we're continuing with that um, this year. Um, the next work package, number two, is about uh, manipulating or trying to manipulate the behaviour of Delia radicum. Um, and that is exploring what some people call a push-pull approach. 
Um, so the idea, uh, the initial idea was to release volatile repellent chemicals within the, the cash crop um, and then also um, to grow a trap crop um, within the cash crop um, to sort of draw the, the flies out. Um, the aim being to eventually get them to lay more eggs around the trap crop than around the, the cash crop. Um, so this work um, has been started off by Anne-Marie Cortezero and her team in, in France, um, and there have been a range of activities. One is that they, they identified that Chinese cabbage was a very good trap crop for, for things like um, cauliflower and broccoli, um, so they have screened a range of Chinese cabbage varieties, and that just shows you um, the numbers of eggs laid on the different varieties, and you've got the, the control here, which is broccoli at the end, so you can see um, there are a range of, of um, varieties that are more preferred than, than marathon. So, so that's the work on the trap crop. Um, then obviously you have to decide how to actually deploy your crop to trap crop um, in relation to the, um, to the cash crop. Um, so again, they've been looking at, at different... Um, whoops, sorry. They've been looking at, at different ways of deploying the crap, trap crop, different arrangements. Uh, again, you can see numbers of eggs laid on um, the broccoli. Sorry. Um, yeah. Um, with different arrangements of the trap crop within the, in the field. Um, and then they've also been looking at the, um, the volatile compounds that you might release within the crop. Um, to try and repel um, the fly. And um, what they found is that the, the volatiles appear to be quite unreliable. Sometimes you get an effect, sometimes you don't. Um, so they've actually decided to move on to non-volatile uh, compounds. Uh, and, for example, they, uh, there's a, an experiment here where they've been looking at... Um, oops, sorry, I'm going to do the wrong thing again. Uh, where they've been looking at, at synaptic acid. And again, number of eggs laid per plant with and without uh, the synaptic acid treatment. Um, so that's the way that it's, it's going now. Um, the third work package is about biological control. Um, and the first part of that is about um, looking at entomopathogenic fungi. Um, and that's being led by Nikolai Wittmeling in Denmark. Um, and basically, they have tested uh, a number of isolates, first of all, to see if they'll establish in the cauliflower rhizosphere, um, whether they'll infect Adelia radicum larvae. Ideally, obviously, you want to kill the larvae before they cause damage, and whether um, they have any effects on the fly behaviour. Um, so they found that, that the ability of the fungi to establish depends on how you inoculate um, the isolates um, and from the experiments they've done they've selected two isolates um, and the best way of applying them is actually to um, colonise grains of rice and then put those into the, uh, the medium. Um, then as far as which stage um, do the entomopathogenic fungi kill um, well unfortunately it seems at least from the lab trials um, that they don't kill the larvae um, and they don't actually uh, produce a mortality until the, until the pupal stage. Um, they're now being evaluated further in semi-field in semi trials. Um, and then they're looking at, at whether um, plants inoculated with the fungi, whether they um, are preferred or not um, by cabbage root flies for egg laying, um, and what they found is that, in general, um, plants inoculated with the fungi are more attractive to uh, Delia radicum females than, than non-inoculated plants. Um, the second part of this work package is concerned with uh, entomopathogenic nematodes. Um, that work's been undertaken uh, by Michael Gaffney uh, from Chagas in Ireland. Um, He's, his um, focus is on conditioning the nematodes, so actually um, exposing them um, to certain temperatures for a while uh, to try and improve their performance before they're applied in the field. 
Um, he has undertaken some field experiments, but um, unfortunately the very hot weather in uh, this summer um, has sort of uh, slowed his uh, acquisition of results. Um, the fourth work package is about then building the IPM toolbox. Um, first of all, we have done a consultation uh, to confirm which tools are used um, already um, and which are considered most promising. As I said at the beginning, um, relatively few of the tools are, decision support tools are used reasonably widely, um, monitoring and forecast, um, but the other tools are not used very widely at all. Um, so the toolbox will consist of um, some of the methods that we're investigating in the project uh, and then also other methods that, that we can bring in. Um, and what we're doing in Work Package 4 is some starting to put those together. Um, so in 2018, there have been a number of um, field experiments. Um, for example, in Norway, Richard Meadow uh, has carried out a large field experiment where he's been looking uh, at a combination of, of trap cropping with the Chinese cabbage, um, a repellent, uh, which in this case was eucalyptol, um, and also exclusion fences, so actually physical barriers um, around um, the crop. And so looking at different combinations of them. Um, and the results aren't completely analysed yet, um, but it's clear that the exclusion fences with or without the trap crops um, give better control than all the other um, treatments. Um, in other, in other partner countries, um, there have been field experiments in Switzerland and in Germany on combinations of antipathogenic fungi and nematodes. And then um, in Switzerland, um, they've also been testing um, sage extracts um, for uh, repellency in laboratory and glasshouse experiments. So Work Package 5 is about assimilation and dissemination of information for best practice. So we set up a website at the beginning of the project. We also have a, a Twitter account. Um, we've looked at the current methods of information dissemination in the different countries. Um, and we've had some discussion about best practice. And we're going to produce a paper um, from this. Um, and then we're also collaborating to um, plan, design and plan stakeholder engagement activities in each country. Um, we'll publish papers on our experimental work. And then to, at the end or towards the end of the project, we'll produce information for dissemination to different audiences, obviously adapted to the local situation in the appropriate language and disseminate that, that information. So we've had a, a range of outputs, which has uh, consisted so far mainly of um, posters, contributions to, to conferences, um, articles, things like that. Um, and just to finish off, then obviously we're, we're halfway through our project. We've got a lot more to, to do. Um, I foresee that there will be a need to develop um, the tools further beyond the end of the end of the project. They're not necessarily going to be ready for uh, commercial use. Um, I think there is a role um, certainly for further development of polyculture. So obviously we've been looking at trap crops within this project, uh, but maybe also companion planting as well, maybe to provide the push instead of um, the, the volatile or the non-volatile compounds. Um, and I think grower uptake of um, these tools uh, will be heavily influenced by how effective they are, obviously, and how cost effective they are, and also by the availability or the lack of availability of um, insecticide. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. For your presentation, uh, say I don't know if there are any questions, say for clarification, because after the four presentations, we still will have uh, a more general discussion.
Well, I have one small question. You mentioned that you have used uh, entomopathogenic fungi, but in fact you said that did not work very well because the larvae were still alive, but, uh, but apparently they were also still feeding, because in fact that's the most important uh, aspect. If they are still alive but not feeding, that would also be fine. Yes, I mean, the, the, the entomopathogenic, yes, I'm just summarising too, too briefly. Um, the entomopathogenic fungi that have been tested in the, in the field trials in um, Switzerland and Germany are commercially available um, yeah, products which yeah, don't necessarily work in the same way. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Um, then we uh, proceed with uh, the second presentation. Uh, and that's about uh, Drosophila Suzuki, also one of the major pests. And the title is Automated Airborne Pest Monitoring of Drosophila Suzuki in Crops and Natural Habitats. <coughs> and the presentation will be given by Johannes Feiring. Thanks for introduction. Um, I'm Johannes Fahrentrap from Zurich University of Applied Sciences. Um, thanks the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present our project. Um, we are now in the beginning of the second half of the project, so I can present only half of the results we hope to get in the end. But um, yeah, let's go. So uh, I guess, so the beamer is not so nice. I guess you all know um, this little fly, which is Drosophila zuki. Um, okay, yeah. Um, so we also call it spotted wing Drosophila because it has these um, dots on the wings, the male flies have them. Um, it is an invasive pest in Europe and it's established uh, now more or less in all the countries and it attacks all the soft berry crops um, at a ripe or even pre-ripe stage. So they are not damaged and in difference to the um, Drosophila species that are um, in their natural habitats over here. They can drill with their um, serrated ovipositors um, into the skin of the ripe fruits. Today, monitoring is conducted with these um, cup traps. They are filled with a liquid lure that contains vinegar and wine, and this is quite laborious, so we thought to make this a bit more easy to handle and to have it um, at least semi-automatic. And yeah, let's see how far we got. Um, this is a small project compared to the previous one. We are only three partners from uh, my university, from University of Aberdeen and uh, Wageningen University and Research. And we, I didn't list the, all the work packages, what, but we have three major parts of the project. That is, um, once, uh, first of all, the trapping of the Drosophila Suzuki with a specific trap that is monitorable by photographs. Uh, these images should be taken by drones. Um, that is David Green that is re responsible for this part. And uh, Lama Koistra is responsible um, for the third part um, that deals with the identification on the imagery uh, of the insects and counting the insects. Um, that was the original idea. We started with this uh, little... Um, picture, we have different crops, uh, we have different landscapes. We have crops, we have hedges, and we have forests, and all the uh, different parts are berries that can be attacked and that are a potential habitat for the fly. Um, we have the traps that should be placed all over these different habitats, and we have a drone that flies from trap to trap, uh, takes images of the trap, and the data will be um, delivered to an automatic pipeline that counts the insects on the trap. 
And this, this data should be used um, for decision support systems giving advice to the producers. Um, that means in this case, um, potentially to wait a little bit further until harvest or to harvest directly in dependence of um, the population size or to treat maybe if this is also still an option. That depends a bit on the retention time um, to harvest. Um, so I, I divided my talk into these three parts. I will start with the part that was done in Switzerland mainly. Um, we selected uh, sticky traps and uh, checked. So um, we needed a trap that has a uh, plain surface to, to take photographs of this surface. So we selected these sticky traps that are not very attractive, but we first checked the different colors of um, these traps that were available on the market in uh, Switzerland. And we could see that it's really not attractive. We had uh, seven individuals in average on a trap uh, changed once a week, so that is really not a lot. But red was uh, significantly the most attractive trap. So then, that is also not so nicely pictured here. We added lure that was not um, reachable for the fly because it was covered in sock, but it makes the trap a bit more attractive. Um, and we could uh, still find a very low number of um, indiv individuals on the sticky traps. Uh, compared to the cup traps, you can see here, I'm um, sorry, this is a strange thing. You can, <laughs> you can see numbers of up to 60 maybe, if you can read that in average, that are in a cup trap and we have only, yeah, let's say four if we sum it up. Another point was um, that the trap needs to be positioned um, in a drone accessible position in the crop, so not in the canopy as we do it usually with the cup traps. And we checked if we could uh, also um, catch insects above the canopy and we were a bit surprised because there were more we could find uh, over, the, uh, over the canopy. And we had another problem, maybe you can see it in the circle, that the flies that were on the, tra on the traps, they can walk on the glue. <laughs> so they just walk along here, they walk up, or the others walk as well, not only those in the circle. But this is the standard trap that is used for all different insects. And also the glue, there's not, not a lot of var var variability, so we cannot just use different glue because there is no other glue on the market that um, can catch the fly. Um, but this is kind of a problem <laughs> we are facing right now. That's, and that led us to develop a new uh, trap uh, that goes without glue, glue and that has the attractant, so the lure inside. But um, I don't know if you can see that. Here is a like a window and behind the window the fly is caught and can walk around a bit and we can take the image through the window and later the fly will die inside the trap. So we are not counting the flies in the trap but we are counting the flies on the image that is taken through the window. I can't show you any results of this because we have only lab results right now. In the lab it works well but it doesn't mean anything I, see, I think. Um, so, for the next part, um, major requirement for the imagery is that we have high quality and high resolution imagery. That means we need the drone to be positioned directly in front of the trap with a distance of about 50 centimeters. And all these things, so flying from trap to trap should work autonomously. There was the aim. That's also a bit difficult, we figured it out, but we are on a way to solve these problems. Uh, 
no, the one before. Yeah, we use different platforms, as you can see here, listed over there. Um, they are flying in front of the trap here, but this is manually um, flown. And uh, the problem of all these platforms that have a fixed camera is often the resolution of the camera or that you cannot fly close enough and you get out of focus if you uh, reach a distance of below one meter. And then we tested how it works to repeatedly fly the same um, parcours from trap to trap. That is working quite well, but only in the X, Y direction, not in the Z direction. In the Z direction, we have quite some difficulties to reach always the same height so that we are positioned in front of the trap. Additionally, we have to take into account um, the position of the sun because sometimes it gets very, um, how do you say, there are a lot of reflections, sorry, from the trap. And uh, then the position has to be a bit adjusted that these reflections are reduced. So there are some points we didn't thought about in the beginning. Um, but we have several ideas to solve these problems. Um, last part is to count the insects on these imagery we, um, we acquire with the drone. We started by acquiring the image by um, handhold camera, so we put it on a tripod and photographed the images. I had the job to annotate all these images, all my students did that, and we delivered everything to Wageningen University, <laughs> and they trained their uh, algorithms and counted the insect. Just to remind you, the fly itself is just two to four millimeters in size. The dots on the wings that are the things that we can identify are even smaller. Um, but they did a quite decent job, I think. Uh, they use two different models, the AlexNet and the GoogleNet, that are kind of um, deep learning methods, and they reach accuracies of around 80% in identifying and counting. Um, to go through just quickly, no, it doesn't. It doesn't make so much sense because the, the, the beamer quality is not high enough. So that are the pictures. And here you c could see the insects and that's how the uh, algorithm identifies them and can count them uh, positively or false positively or false negatives can also happen. So, um, the, uh, we did a bit of communication of this project. We had some presentations and posters on conferences. We had some press releases. We set up a web page and Twitter account. Uh, and we have one paper that is kind of related to this project published by now. And just summing up, we still have some things to do but we also still have one and a half years left and we hope that we can um, yeah, reach the goal that we had set. I think there's great potential with these deep learning methods to analyze imagery even for very small objects if quality is high enough. That was really, um, yeah, surprisingly for me that this is really working. So we were discussing that before and I believed, yeah, maybe, maybe not. But it is working and that's really a cool thing. Uh, future tasks, we will do the proof of concept. Hopefully complete this in the coming season uh, that we can fly autonomously from trap to trap. And we will work hardly, especially on that part uh, that uh, the data that come out of the analysis pipeline can <laughs> be at least uh, prepared to include in two decision support systems that could help the farmers um, 
and give some advice. We didn't do anything for the um, communication to, to the growers now until today uh, because there's not so much to report directly. I think that will be also a big part of next autumn if we have more field data. After this project is finished, and if it is working, I think this is um, just demonstrating that it could work. It's not ready for use for the farmers. And it is um, adaptable to different pests, I think. And that's the big thing in the end. Because at least in Switzerland, Drosophila zuki is not the biggest problem anymore. They are more afraid for instance, of these guys, and farmers can handle the fruit fly. So with this, I just want to say thank you to all the guys who worked in this project, and maybe you want to go by and have a look at our web page as well. Thanks. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I don't know if there's a question. Or? Thank you, Alice. Uh, it's only the male flies you can identify in the photographs. So how you can identify the rest of the population? Yeah. So in most cases, it's 50-50. Sometimes a bit more male, sometimes a bit more female. No, yes. no. From our experiment, yes, it is. <laughs> There, there's loads of published literature on the subject, and uh, it's more females to be in the country than the males. Uh, so, so if you're going to be able to identify a few males on a trap, that's not going to give any population numbers that, that's in the area. So no, how, how, how can that improve on what growers are already doing in regards to trapping with beta traps? Um, like I, I'm, the <coughs> I'm representing UK funder on the on the, on the project, yeah. and, I, and I'm having actually difficulty in selling this project to the industry in the UK, because they don't see how it's going to improve control of SWD. That's what that's what I'm getting fed back to me. So, it's a monitoring system, yes. Yeah, it's a monitoring system, and it can give you a number that is maybe not completely related to the population density. But, but what's the value then of that? that you can see if it's there or if it's not there, and you can still establish a, th a certain threshold, I think, even if you catch only the males. So this threshold is not yet established, and I don't believe that we are going to establish this threshold within this project, but that was also not promised. Yeah, but at the end of the day, but it's the females that do the damage to the fruit. Um, yeah, sure, the females there. are, but yeah. the males are also in the same <laughs> region as the females. Yeah. So I don't think that's yeah, the I'm just simply saying, yeah, I, I, I'm having difficulty selling it to the industry because uh, they don't see where, it's, where the APM is coming from. Because they already know the beast is there. We know it's there. We have a, for example, UK-wide uh, sure. uh, network of, tra of traps for SWD. So we know it's there already. And the industry are feeding back to me, how much monitoring do we need to do on a pest that we know is there already? I think it's very interesting what you're doing because I think you're preparing for other pest organisms. But Rosophila Suzuki, I think the system we have is somehow working already. And you have to be careful to say you construct a threshold with a, tra with a trapping system or monitoring system like that. And then you can say you have a, a certain uh, infestation level on no, different crops or fruits and things like that. So. The question for me also is if you cannot detect females really, in a way you can do it maybe with, uh, uh, with the traps which are existing currently because maybe they are more attractive than, than uh, your the, the sticky traps or the system you are currently using and have, have developed. I, I, I also would have problems to, to see what the advantage would be currently to the other system what's already in use and where we where there are a lot of data and uh, if you cannot distinguish females and, and from other drosophilids maybe which are also there uh, you know it's very really a very complex story and I think you have to be careful to draw certain conclusions or um, to evoke some expectations 
I think what you have mentioned later on, that you can uh, use the system for other pest organisms, this is the biggest, for, m for me personally, this is the biggest advantage of the work you're doing currently now. But you know there are, is other work going on with uh, other pest organisms also somewhere else. So um, sure. maybe you, it could be better explained what you see as a real advantage of this uh, work. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'm not the best in explaining that. Might be true. Um, but I think, or I didn't say that you can set a, a threshold that is equal to some population, but you can set a threshold that allows you to give advice to the farmers. That is what I think. And I don't think that you need to detect the female specifically because we usually catch both and it, at least in our cases and with the different traps we catch always equal levels. I don't know where your numbers are from. I also read the literature and it's going 60-50 or the other way around, 60-40 uh, or the other way around. But in the end it's always something about 50-50 and I couldn't find any other results in all the hundred traps I put out in the field. Okay, I think uh, um, we stopped the discussion now, but maybe after the next two presentations we still have time to continue on the, this issue uh, because I also myself have still a few questions, but that's for later. And then, uh, um, Say so the third presentation will be uh, about a holistic approach for the management of crazy or hairy root disease caused by regiogenic agrobacteria in tomato, cucumber, and eggplant cultivation. And the presentation will be given by Hans Redius. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. So uh, I'm coordinator of this uh, Sea Root uh, Control Project, uh, in which uh, seven uh, different partners are involved. Uh, four from uh, from Belgium, one from Switzerland, and uh, two from uh, from France. Um, so this uh, project deals with the management of uh, crazy roots uh, in uh, tomato, cucumber, uh, and eggplant. But I will start with uh, a brief background of this disease. Crazy roots or hairy root disease uh, is a disease mainly found or mainly observed in hydroponic cultivations of uh, tomato, cucumber and eggplant. And uh, systems, uh, symptoms uh, are typical that for the formation of uh, excessive root formation. Excessive root formation, looking for the pointer here, uh, as you can see here. So this is a substrate which, uh, with an infected plant and you see excessive root proliferation uh, especially compared with uh, healthy plants. And ultimately, this leads to very uh, packed substrates, uh, which hampers uh, nutrient uptake. And uh, eventually, this leads to uh, a loss in, uh, in yields of uh, approximately 10 uh, percent. <coughs> so um, first symptoms uh, were observed in the 1970s in the UK. But uh, this is the current situation. Uh, several European uh, countries are uh, affected by this uh, disease and uh, a couple of years ago we referred to the disease spread uh, between Paris and Copenhagen but uh, nowadays uh, it's uh, also north of Copenhagen and uh, also more southern of, uh, of Paris. It's also a rapidly increasing uh, disease uh, which you can see here so these are uh, figures of uh, flounders so we uh, uh, surveyed several greenhouses in, in, in the Flemish part of Belgium and you see a rapid increase of uh, affected greenhouses uh, up to 45% in uh, 2017. So it's a, an important disease uh, and it's also a very persistent disease. Uh, this is mainly because agrobacterium can cause uh, uh, the formation of biofilms and when it's residing in the biofilm it's uh, protected from uh, disinfectants uh, and so on. So this is a major problem and therefore it's very hard uh, to get rid of this, uh, this pathogen. Uh, and I forgot to mention this disease is uh, actually caused by what we call rhizogenic agrobacteria. Uh, these are actually uh, agrobacteria that harbor a uh, specific plasmids uh, containing genes that uh, ultimately lead to uh, the symptoms of the disease. So um, disease is very hard to get rid of. 
the main objectives of this uh, project was to develop long-term uh, and sustainable IPM solutions to tackle this uh, disease. And we uh, defined several approaches. So first of all, the first approach is uh, that we uh, wanted to look for alternatives for biofilm treatment, so more sustainable uh, chemical treatment methods. The second part, we focus on cultivation techniques in order to reduce the, the symptoms uh, caused by this pathogen. And thirdly, we also uh, looked at uh, the use of biocontrol organisms uh, to uh, reduce uh, infection rate. However, uh, first of all, we have to know uh, what we're dealing with. And uh, in the first work package, uh, we surveyed uh, agrobacterial islets uh, throughout Europe to see whether or not there were uh, relationships between the different islets coming from, for instance, uh, Russia or uh, France uh, or other countries. So we started with uh, sampling uh, of islets uh, in Flanders, Europe uh, and beyond. And we actually uh, isolated 81 strains but uh, we also did uh, a rapid pre-screening, and I will not go into details, but um, this is actually to uh, exclude non-unique uh, islets. And in this way, we retained uh, 69 islets coming from uh, different countries. So uh, indeed, the, the <coughs> color of the slide is not, not perfect, but uh, you can see that we have uh, islets from the Netherlands uh, up to UK and several uh, other European countries uh, in between. So first of all, uh, these uh, 69 islets were uh, characterized. Uh, first of all, uh, the genotype was determined using a multi locus sequence analysis by sequencing uh, partial genes, partial housekeeping genes. And uh, secondly, we also did a phenotypical characterization by characterizing the islets for their growth at different temperatures, growth at different pHs, biofilm formation, and catalase activity, and peroxide tolerance. So when we looked at uh, the, the phenotypical characterization, uh, we immediately saw, sorry, saw uh, that there is a very wide diversity between the phenotypes and the different islets. This is an example which uh, is a bean plot, and the bean plot gives you the distribution of the peroxide tolerance, in this case, for the different islets tested. And you can immediately see that there is a very high variability between the different islets, islets that are not tolerant to peroxide and islets that are very tolerant uh, to peroxide. So this is the first uh, important uh, thing we, we observed. When we looked at the genotypic uh, characterization, based on the MLSA analysis, we could uh, develop uh, or construct a phylogenetic tree uh, which actually shows the relationships between different <coughs> islets uh, different strains islet uh, throughout Europe. And it's maybe a very uh, dense uh, picture, but I will not go into detail, but maybe if we zoom on the upper part of this uh, figure, then it's more easy to explain. So the strain numbers are here. The phylogenetic tree uh, represents the relationship between the islets, and the color of the strains represents the, the sample origin. So uh, uh, the strains that are in black were isolated from Belgium, strains in red, isolated from UK, uh, and so on. Uh, in this row, you can see uh, the strains that are uh, nominated with an asterisk, they have catalase activity. Uh, in this part, the resistance towards peroxide is uh, presented, and in this part, the biofilm formation capacity is presented. And when you immediately look at the different strains, the colors are actually spread throughout this tree, meaning that there is no real um, phylogenetic relationship between islets that are uh, coming from uh, a single country. So it's actually spread all over Europe. And this gives actually a, a very big problem because uh, this wide diversity. Um, we also have some, some issues because we cannot uh, formulate a, a single uh, management because if you can see uh, in this part here, there are some strains that are very resistant to peroxide and others are not resistant to peroxide. And uh, peroxide is, uh, in this case, a uh, disinfectant that is often used in, in greenhouses. So there is a, is a problem there. So conclusions in this uh, first work package is actually that there is a very high diversity. Um, the efficacy of uh, peroxide treatments 
uh, to treat the biofilms depends really on the isolate present in a specific greenhouse. And this makes this problem more complex than originally anticipated. So there is no one solution fits all. In this, third, uh, this work package, there are uh, the, the future activities uh, involve uh, genome comparison of 20 selected strange, strains uh, for which we want to go into more depth uh, regarding the genes that are related to the virulence uh, itself. So in a second work package, um, we looked at a specific uh, approach uh, and looked at alternatives for biofilm treatment. And uh, in this case, uh, the French partner uh, Viginov evaluated uh, 11 commercial available uh, biocide or plant protection uh, products, first in, a, in lab scale. And um, after these experiments, they uh, retained, they selected uh, three different uh, products to be tested further in the next period, uh, to be tested further in uh, pilot scale systems and also uh, in the greenhouse. So these are the, the future activities regarding uh, this part. Uh, in our group, we also looked at uh, specific anti-biofilm compounds. So in this case, we screened some uh, compounds that are really um, selective for their anti-biofilm activity rather than uh, their efficacy against uh, free living bacteria. And you can see that uh, in this table, so in this table, the effective concentration is uh, presented, the effective concentration needed to uh, kill off 50% of the free living bacteria. If we look at the lower table, it's the same uh, five uh, antibiofilm compounds, and you see the effective concentration required to reduce the biofilm with 50%. And for instance, this uh, first uh, biofilm compound, it seems that it doesn't have a big effect on the free living bacteria, but it has a very big effect on the biofilm. So, and this is actually what we're looking for. Uh, because, as I mentioned before, the persistence of this disease is mainly caused by the fact that uh, agrobacterium is residing in this, uh, in this biofilm. Uh, also for antibiofilm compound 3, uh, we have the same uh, results. So actually, um, there is a promise, uh, a potential of these antibiofilms uh, to be used uh, in practice. So in, a, in another work package, we looked at uh, different cultivation techniques that are able to reduce uh, the symptoms. Uh, and we tested several different techniques. And what we saw there is uh, with, in, in tomato, we saw that opening of the slabs of the substrate uh, is able to reduce the, the symptoms uh, caused by this uh, hairy root disease. However, uh, Swiss partners also tested this for, sorry, tested this for uh, the eggplant. And also we tested it for a cucumber and uh, similar observations were made, similar conclusions are made. And uh, in any case, uh, or in each case, opening of the slabs is able to reduce the symptoms. As you can see here, this is the fruit weight of uh, uninfected uh, plants, in this case for eggplant. Opening of the slabs doesn't result in a real significant uh, reduction. However, if you look at the artificial infection of uh, eggplant, we see uh, approximately an 8% reduction in the, in the yield. And this is in agreement with uh, figures that are also found in, uh, in literature uh, with the 10% uh, yield loss caused by hairy root disease. If we go uh, to the next uh, work package, we also <coughs> looked at the possibility for biocontrol. And in this case, uh, three different groups um, started uh, isolation and screening for uh, other bacteria that have antagonistic activity against this uh, agrobacterium uh, pathogen. So in our group, we tested uh, several different strains, ending up with a couple of Penibacillus strains with antagonistic activity against uh, agrobacterium. Also in Agroscope, Switzerland, uh, there was a screening of their own isolates and also newly isolated strains, and they uh, ended up with uh, 12 isolates with one particular islet which uh, showed uh, a lot of uh, potential and also at the uh, Viginov there was a specific isolation <coughs> procedure using a, a metagenetics approach I will not go into detail but uh, these three different uh, approaches are quite uh, complementary uh, in the end we ended up with several uh, bacteria with antagonistic activity against this agrobacterium and also we um, observed that the activity spectrum is a little bit different meaning that we have different strains 
uh, which could be uh, of use uh, in, in practice. So then we tested uh, our strain, uh, our biocontrol strain in uh, preliminary greenhouse experiments. And uh, what we see uh, there is that uh, we, if you look at the percentage of infected plants, uh, you see here uh, the control, control plants that are not infected with agrobacterium nor treated with, with the BCO. And then we have uh, two uh, types of plants that are artificially uh, infected with agrobacterium. But one of these is uh, treated with uh, BCO. And uh, as you can see here, uh, especially after 19 weeks, there is a big difference uh, in uh, infection rates with BCO treatment compared with uh, the untreated uh, tomato plants. So there is a, a big reduction. However, uh, after a while, this uh, big difference levels off somehow. So it's also an indication that the BCO shows potential in the greenhouse. However, uh, there's still some uh, needs for optimization of this uh, application. Uh, a similar assay was done on eggplants in Switzerland with uh, their uh, BCO. And uh, here you can see the assessment of the root proliferation. So they, they measured the, uh, the, the root surface actually uh, in a digital way. And if you uh, compare the, the blanks, the agrobacterium inoculated and then the plants which were pre-treated with a commercial BCO and the newly isolated BCO, then you can see uh, a difference in the, yeah, the root proliferation. So the blank has the lowest uh, root proliferation, the agrobacterium has a very high uh, root proliferation, <laughs> it's a 42, and I'm, I'm not sure if you can, uh, can, can read this. However, the, the Swiss uh, inoculum is also able to reduce the surface of the uh, root structure, which also indicates that there is a potential to use this, these kinds of uh, BCOs uh, in practice. So and then we come up to the, the last work package uh, in which we wanted to uh, validate integrated pest management uh, techniques. And this was uh, an experiment done in uh, a small scale uh, tomato greenhouse trial in uh, what we call these, uh, these tunnel experiments. It's carried out by the research station of uh, vegetable production. And uh, also there, we uh, tried several uh, applications ranging from opening slabs, so a cultivation technique. Uh, we added <laughs> some uh, anti-biofilm compounds to see whether or not it can reduce uh, infection rates uh, in practice. And also a combination of opening slabs and these anti-biofilm compounds. And a combination of BCO opening slabs and the antibiofilm compound. So these are quite uh, preliminary uh, uh, results. But um, we monitored uh, infection rates after several uh, in several time uh, periods. Uh, of course, in the beginning uh, there was no plants were infected, and here you can see the reference, uh, which is the plants inoculated with agrobacterium, and then the different treatments. So all plants were uh, inoculated with agrobacterium, but for instance this one is uh, uh, combined with opening the slabs, uh, here anti-biofilm compounds are added or a combination, and there uh, you have the combination of BCO uh, and opening slabs uh, and anti-biofilm compound. And if you look at the uh, infection rate, maybe uh, at the end here, um, indeed there is a slight difference between the infection rates when slabs are opened and uh, there's also a slight reduction uh, when the combi combination was applied. Here is a, yeah, a very remarkable reduction in plant infection. However, this was mainly due to the phytotoxic effect of this uh, antibiofilm compound uh, too. Nevertheless, uh, it might be the case that if we lower the concentration of uh, this antibiofilm compound, the phytotox effect might be reduced but uh, on the other hand, also the antibiofilm activity might uh, be retained. So uh, we cannot uh, exclude this one. It might also show potential for uh, future uh, research. So research uh, perspectives. Uh, we still have a uh, half a year to go, um, but uh, there are still some, some, uh, some gaps to be filled in, I think. So uh, what we first want to do is uh, to work further on the genome comparison of different isolates. Uh, they can uh, definitely provide uh, new insights. 
And then there is uh, definitely uh, a room for optimization of the BCOs. And we saw it in our greenhouse trials, but we also saw it in the greenhouse trials uh, which were uh, performed in, uh, at Agroscope. And then also we want to look further into the potential of these anti-biofilm compounds. Uh, this uh, really should be uh, assessed in, uh, in more detail. And uh, obviously we want to uh, look further to the combined uh, techniques, which is really an integrated pest management. Uh, but um, for some cases it has to be uh, uh, performed. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the activities in our research groups and also in France they can uh, be continued in uh, projects that were uh, recently granted, uh, the Agrofilm project, which is still uh, going uh, until 2020, I think. And uh, we also got recently uh, sorry, uh, a new project funded, uh, the Baraton project, which is, which is a four-year project in which we really want to focus on anti-biofilm and biocontrol. So transfer of the results, uh, we have a couple of uh, publications in uh, scientific and journals and uh, conference proceedings and also uh, some publications in non-scientific journals which are mainly, uh, which mainly target uh, growers or grower uh, organization. And uh, lastly, uh, we also uh, at regular time intervals, we disseminate our results to the sector in what we call the user group meetings in which uh, several companies are represented and also several growers are represented. And in uh, January, uh, we will organize a joint symposium with all uh, project partners um, on uh, 15 and 16 of January. So all of you are welcome uh, if you're interested. And by this, I will uh, like to end with uh, conclusions. So main thing is that there is a high diversity uh, in these agrobacterium islets spread all over uh, Europe which uh, makes the problem uh, a bit more complex than anticipated. And we definitely saw that these anti-biofilm compounds uh, that are uh, really having an effect on the biofilm itself, that they show potential uh, to reduce hairy root disease, but it still should be uh, confirmed in pilot scale and greenhouse uh, trials. Some cultivation techniques, uh, such as uh, opening the slabs, actually they, they can not really uh, reduce infection, <coughs> but it can reduce the symptoms associated with uh, the disease. And then there is uh, the identification of several and novel antagonistic uh, bacteria that uh, we think uh, hold great potential uh, to use in, in biocontrol uh, strategies. However, also this part needs further optimization because until now uh, we don't have any idea of the mole molecular uh, mechanisms underlying this uh, antagonistic activity. So uh, overall, there is uh, more research needed to optimize some aspects and uh, in particular uh, the combination of these uh, strategies. And uh, by this I would like to uh, thank the different partners. I will not go over them, but you can see the different partners here. and. Uh, the main people, or the main people <coughs> involved in the project, are uh, captured in the picture at uh, Agroscope. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Uh, very nice location. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, there's still time for one quick question. Yeah. Just for the sake of knowledge, what happens when you put the disease? Um, just for the sake of knowledge, what happens if you put a diseased crop, like a tomato or, or other kind of crop, into regular soil? What happens to the hmm. root growth? Yeah. I was just wondering, yeah. like opening slabs and those well, things. Um, the problem is, is mainly an issue in hydroponics cultivation. Uh, it's not seen that often in, uh, in soil, but uh, of course in soil the roots have room to proliferate. The main problem in the, in the hydroponic system is that the roots are very dense and packed in the substrate and that hampers really the nutrient uptake and also irrigation and so on, which is less of the case in, in soil grown uh, tomatoes because there the roots can uh, grow a little bit further and the nutrient uptake is not hampered as much as in the hydroponic system. Okay, thank you.
Uh, we have to proceed with uh, the last presentation in this uh, session. And that's about unification of IPM forces to control on mites in berries, soft fruits and woody ornamentals. And it will be given by Joachim Oudenaar. Okay, uh, good afternoon everybody. My name is Joachim Oudenaert. Uh, I will give a short overview uh, of the UNIFORCE project. Uh, first, yeah, background and main objectives. So this was a mite project and mainly a mite project in minor crops, more specifically azalea, strawberry and berries. They are all minor crops in the different partner countries and um, have different mites as problems, like tetranichid mites, tarsanimid mites, eriophyte mites, or the pest mites, um, which cause pests on a various variety of those crops. And predatory mites are, of course, the solution we would like to integrate to solve those problems uh, according to the principles of IPM. Um, so there were some practical questions. All the partners already have experience with these mites. We wanted to exchange our knowledge and solve some practical questions, uh, which still remain. Um, to improve the IPM within the eight principles of IPM. So on the level of monitoring, um, there are different ways of monitoring areophyte mites and tarsinimid mites. So we gathered our knowledge, we exchanged uh, strategies and um, scouting, uh, yeah, scouting methods kind of. Um, it was very important also like there within our project group, there was a taxonomist um, who was yeah, specialized in mite taxonomy. So he helped us to distinguish mite species because not every tarsinimid is the same and this has important implications. So this way also uh, information was exchanged within our group. Of course, the non-chemical control, so use of predatory mites in field, experience, uh, in field experiments. Also here experience was exchanged among the partners and pollen food to support the population buildup of those uh, predatory mites. Uh, on top of that, integrated chemical control, because mainly many of the growers, especially in Azalea and Belgium also, they are focused still on um, spraying chemicals, but everybody knows that's not the future anymore. And these predatory mites, they do work. So we need to uh, help the growers to adopt these strategies with the predatory mites. And therefore, they need to be able still to rely on chemicals for if things go out of control. So we did a side effects test of which chemicals growers could select there are, let's say, 10 favorite acaricides which they would like to use in case things go wrong um, on the Swirsky mite, which is the most used mite to control torsinamid mites. And on the level of prevention and plant disease, um, we gathered information to get a better understanding of the hormone response, how the plant responds to a mite attack and explore possibilities of volatiles, mainly because our Spanish project partner has lots of experience with this in citrus and we wanted to adapt this to a to the other crops. Um, okay, so I said a bit why this international collaboration. We have similar challenges, complementary expertise with different solutions, and uh, we are all working in minor crops, so all the information we can gather and exchange is important. So CIPM was a unique opportunity for us to exchange and validate practical knowledge that we have, mainly the Trinichid mites on strawberry, blackberry, current, the Tarsinimid mites, which are a big problem in Azalea, and eriophyte mites on uh, the different berry crops. Um, so partners were Ilvo and PCS from Belgium, Wageningen University from Holland, Agroscope in Switzerland, and uh, the University of Gome in Spain. Um, so I'll give you a short overview of the results. We have many more results, but they are similar in the different crops. So we'll just go through them quickly. Um, so on the level of monitoring, we saw yeah, the Berlis funnel was a classical method. Sieve and filter method is being adopted and mainly used in tarsinimids. And in the berry crops, they mainly used sticky tape methods. Uh, apart from that, there is also the zonal centrifugation method, which is used in nematodes. And uh, partners were adopting this to the, especially tarsinimid mites are also only 0.1 millimeter big. So this is a method that also works for them, the same for the eriophyte mites, but it's not ready for practice yet. So uh, they are still working on it in the project time they started to explore the possibilities and they're still working on this. Uh, so what we did we do to characterize the mite communities. So we had different azalea varieties. We used 19 different varieties because they all have a different matter of uh, tolerance to tarsinimid mites. And uh, because before five years ago, we thought, okay, tarsinimid mites on azalea, that's a problem, but not always because there are uh, many different tarsinimid mites. 
And we discovered, thanks to the project, um, the possibility of so much sampling that mainly begonia mite, Polyphaga toxinemis latus, latus, is directly related to um, damage symptoms on these azalea crops. There are also other um, toxinemid mites, uh, which come, they are the other symbols here, and they are not linked to damage symptoms on these mm -hmm. azalea crops. And this is only one example. I'm not going to show the graph of all 19 uh, varieties of azalea. But this way we could see the moment the Polyphagotoxinemis latis was found in the crop, damage would uh, go very fastly. Um, similar in the berry crop research, this is uh, from raspberry. It was important for them to know like how can we monitor overwintering berry crops best to predict um, where the areophytes will be if they are present or not. So they checked on which height of the crop is the, the main place where the, the areophytes are. And this was between like FGH, like I would say the upper half of the plant. That's their conclusion. Um, on the level of plant defense, um, jasmonic acid and salicylic acid are two uh, important hormones that are used to uh, link kind of insect or, or uh, disease damage to plants, how the plant responds to this. And um, on the azalea with the tarsinimid mites, it was found that there is no jasmonic acid response, but there is a salicylic acid response. And this we did uh, on the experiment where we checked the population on our different azalea varieties. On tolerant varieties, there was no, yeah, very low salicylic acid levels. But on the ones where there is a higher level of polyphagotoxinemis latis, there was a, a higher level of salicylic acid. Um, then on the level of control, um, we checked eight commercially available phytosates because we only want to work with um, technologies like strategies that can be directly adapted by the growers. So we took eight commercially available phytosates. Um, we put them on different, yeah, in uh, four applications on different azalea groups um, against polyphagotarsinimus latus, against the hazardous begonia mite. So we compare them all. Our classical strategy is Swirsky every 14 days. So every two weeks we uh, do a dose of Swirsky, 50 Swirsky per uh, square meter. And this is a strategy that works already, but we want to compare this with all the other commercially available predatory mites because we want to see if there are more possibilities. And also a bit of new strategy um, is uh, apart from every 14 day switch mite, we also did the first month two times switch mite and the rest of the season every 14 days only pollen feed to see if this can hold the population of switch or other uh, predatory mites high. And indeed, this was the case. We saw that. Um, so, yeah. um, so here, Swirsky is um, still gave good results, but we saw a part. Something is going. Yeah. Is uh, that the cucumiris predator Neosilis cucumiris also gave good results, and we did this experiment something similar to this eight nine years ago, and then we saw no result of cucumiris. But this is companies Biobest and uh, Copper sat together with us on this that their um, production quality is also higher and more stable. That's why predatory mites are in general more reliable now than 10 years ago. And cucumbers came out as a, a good control agent also um, for the begonia mite. The same thing in our strategy, here we counted the number of predatory mites. So the first on the, the lower bar is kind of the strategy where every 14 days we add predatory mites. But if we switch to the strategy with the pollen feed, so only two times uh, predatory mites and then the rest of the season um, pollen feed. We see that in every case with all predatory mites, the population of predatory mites is higher. So this is, I think, a, a very nice result, uh, especially to go to with the growers. Um, then we also did this side effects test where we tested um, eight different chemicals and one um, growth inhibitor. Bonsi is a growth inhibiting product which is used very regularly by growers because um, they want to make a nice ball-shaped azalea. So it has to be, uh, the growth has to be regulated kind of. That's something very typical for azalea. And we saw that uh, after three days after application, there was no immediate knockdown effect of the predatory mites of Swirsky in this case. But if we checked again after 14 days, we saw that everywhere with every uh, caricide, the population was about 50% compared to the control. So we want, then we wondered, okay, population goes down. From what moment is it safe to start reintroducing predatory mites? And uh, we checked after 14 days, we reintroduced predatory mites. And 14 days later, we checked how many there were present. 
compared to the control again, and we saw still that for most of the carousels it was only about 50%. Nisuren and Nilbenop were a bit safer. Bonzi, which is not an acaricide, was also had less negative influence. But if we did this one month after treatment, almost all the acaricides were at about 100%, except for a few like Fertie Mac Masai. So all this information is important information that we can communicate to the growers. And that's a bit the next phase because Unifor's project is finished. So let's say the research has been done. So it's important now to disseminate this information to the growers. So if I can say in very short, what did we gain on, from a research point of view from Unifors? It is more knowledge on how to distinguish damaging and non-damaging toxinimids, a better insight when and where to monitor areophyte mites in the berry crops. We have a better understanding of which predatory mites are capable of controlling pest mites. I showed you now the example for Azalea. Similar results were also done for the berry crops, but we don't have time to show all the graphs. Um, but we have this knowledge now also how to use them and apply them in a more sustainable way. This is like use the addition of pollen instead of all the time adding uh, predatory mites. And the impact, the side effects of the acaricides on, uh, the, in this case, the predatory mites, Swiski, plus reintroduction time. So all these results should lead, must lead to more efficient control of the pest mites. But of course, if we don't disseminate this in a good way to the growers, it won't happen in practice. So that's the next point. So that's why we disseminated all the information we gained from our uh, experiments. We made in a, a very easy, a simplified way, so growers will use it very easily. So we made, fold, we made a folder and key and posters for growers, how they can see in their crop, what are the typical symptoms of the different mites, um, what can we do, some explanation of uh, what are tarsinimid mites, what are the different solutions we have. We made a brochure which uh, summarizes all of uh, the Unifor's knowledge kind of on the level of each country. So this is available on our website also, pcc.be. So uh, if you have some time, you can check it out. So this we also give to the growers. Um, ongoing dissemination, of course, we do talks and demonstrations at grower events. We write articles in grower magazines. On the scientific level, some publications are still ongoing. So they are still writing them at the moment. and people are still going to go to congresses and symposia, mainly for this plant defense story, for uh, the hormone uh, story. But one of the more important parts is we have a crop protection advisory service. And thanks to all the knowledge we gained about knowing which predatory mites work, uh, how, when and how much pollen to add, um, all this knowledge we, yeah, we use and we bring to the growers directly because thanks to this crop protection advisory service, we give training to a grower and his employees on how to identify the different mites to make them aware, look, not only if you manage to sample a tarsinimid mite, be aware that there are different types of tarsinimid mites. Uh, they can bring us samples for identification because, of course, no grower will be capable of identifying tarsinimid mites, distinguishing the species by himself. But then they know if they see symptoms or if they want, they can bring us every month a sample and we will check if there are tarsinimid mites and which types there are. And of course, growers who are using beneficials, who want to start up or who are busy with this, they can call us. Then we go to their facility, to the grower themselves, to advise them and look for your company and your crop, this is the best solution. Uh, the same thing as how to use uh, chemicals as a local treatment, because it's not because we say, okay, this chemical is good, it's safe against the predatory mite, a grower will start spraying it twice a week, and then of course it's not so safe. So for all these little things, we call this yeah, tailored advice for growers, which we see as a very important aspect uh, of IPM uh, to bring the research to the growers. We also have a yearly poster with all the chemicals which are still um, allowed to be used in the ornamental sector in Belgium. We have information about the resistance groups to which they belong. Um, this, uh, these colors here, they explain like, how they are safe for uh, predatory mites, for parasitic wasps, and which those they can use. So all the information we gain, um, which can help growers with IPM, with combining chemicals and uh, predatory mites, uh, we summarize into this one poster. So growers are waiting every January for the new version. Of course, they call us in between to be up to date or if they have specific questions. Um, of course, yeah, we didn't solve everything yet, far from. Um, so we think that uh, what we saw in uni uh, for IPM in general kind of is that validation and demonstration trials are very important because I'm talking only about ornamentals, but even within Azalea, we tested 19 different varieties with different results. So every different plant will react in a different way. So validation and demonstration 
of strategies in one crop or one variety of crop stay important for another one. Also, direct advice to growers remains necessary. Only putting something on a website or sending a poster to growers is not enough. You really have to kind of go to the growers facility, tell them exactly like, okay, this is how you grow. First, you have to learn how do they grow. You know the limits within which a grower will adopt IPM, and then you can help him and uh, with the knowledge you have. Um, also, about on the plant defense level, new insights were gained on the hormone response to mite attack. Also, on volatile analysis, uh, many insights were gained, but it's not practical yet. So here, there is still some work to do to get something practical, especially that growers will be able to use. Um, but they are also working on it. So if I can summarize in very short, grower adoption of IPM requires information. Thanks to projects like this where we can do research, we can fill in the blanks, kind of. Lots of demonstration because a grower only believes what he can see and grower advice at the grower facility and not once, not twice, but again and again and again. So well, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, are there any questions? Thank you very much for this uh, very encouraging presentation. I think it's nice to see that what has been tested in uh, cucumber, for example, was feeding pollen to uh, improve the effect of predatory mites, uh, is also working in the other crops. I think it's very important, yeah. as it's also for the practical use uh, for the growers. I have just one question. You mentioned the side effect testing of the different acaricides towards the predatory mites. Uh, did you do kind of a greenhouse test or yeah. semi-field test or was it a lab test because it's important? Uh it was, well, I would call it, wait, can I go back? No. Well, it was, uh, maybe you remember the picture, yeah, it yeah, was yeah, little yeah. blocks of plants, yeah, about yeah. One, one and a half square meter, yeah. and we tested it directly on the plants. So we added predatory mice <laughs> and overdose. Because but the whole plant? On all the plants, on, on the group of plants. We the put these sachets in the plants, but we do it on a big overdose because mm -hmm. we want a high population. Mm -hmm. It's easier to work with bigger numbers. We count the, the total yep. that we see. I, I know and how it yeah, works. So I have been working with this also. And my last question is, all the other side effects uh, on beneficial organisms, do you test them yourselves or do you take them well, from lists, tables which are existing, yeah. like... IUBC, for example, Both or we combine. So we use the combined. IUBC okay. information, also information we can get through like IPM impact, mm -hmm. and we do also our own tests because many of the IUBC IPM impact they are lab tests, yeah. and we try to do a yearly side effect test mm -hmm. if we get funding through different measures, mm -hmm. and if we do our let's say more applied semi field version, we update it with our semi field results. But the, where we don't have them, we use the IUBC or uh, IPM impact. Thank yeah. you. Okay, I, th I think this is already really a, a very advanced project with yes. concrete results. The project is finalized also, yeah. Yeah, and I think that, uh, say, I mentioned um, uh, that we have Imura, the minor users database, with all the lists of the minor users needs. And indeed, for some of the problems with mites, we can make just a clear reference to uh, your projects and, uh, and the outcome. Yeah. And, uh, Okay. Thank you. Okay, we still have some time for um, questions to uh, the presenters for a more general discussion. Then, uh, in fact, uh, I still have a question uh, also to the to the other presenters. Uh, say, is there already a concrete solution available, or how far, how long do you think that will take? Uh, for example, uh, Rosemary, you mentioned uh, um, with these exclusion fences and uh, trap crops, that could be a solution. Is that already that advanced that we can advise that to, uh, to growers or? Um, uh, not the trap crops, but the exclusion fences, I mean, they are, they are used commercially um, in Norway, in one particular situation, um, yeah, and there has there has been some work else elsewhere on on that, um, but I think yeah, the 
the, tro the trap crops needs further work. And the, and the big problem with, with trap crops is, is then testing things on a large enough scale and getting growers to, yeah, to test them because um, that's, that's part of the problem that you know, our group has run into, that, that you, do, you can only do trials on quite a small scale and you actually need in the end to test it on a, on a field scale. Yeah. I had I had a question to the um was open life project. Um would it be possible to use to, the sorry I've had a microphone. Okay. I had a question. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah okay. To the um Drosophila project. And I was wondering if you can use your your setup to um not identify but see new invasive pests like because it doesn't un doesn't learn as it's deep learning but it doesn't recognize a pest which lands on it and so it must be a new one is that something you consider like for checking let's say we know there's a new pest in Italy showing up like in the southern parts of Europe and we might expect it sooner or later <coughs> but you could place traps in the Rhine Valley or so where you know they come up that way to see if they show up first that something? Yeah, so if you are at the stage that you can have sample images that you can feed into your algorithm, then yes. If not, there's no chance to learn from the algorithm because it never knows all the insects that might be present on the trap. So if you're looking for a specific, you need annotated images. Then it should work, yeah. Well, say now you have the microphone. I have <laughs> still a question for you. You mentioned that f uh, with your traps, you use red because that gave better results over blue and orange. Then, uh, but uh, what about yellow? Because um, um, I've seen other presentations, um, and that insects are very well attracted to yellow. So um, we didn't test yellow because from. Uh, published research, it's al already more or less clear that red is more attractive than yellow. We just wanted to make sure that this is with our traps the same, because red is not red always. It might be different also what the insects see. And if we consider the literature on Drosophila melanogaster, it's also clear that they're not attracted by yellow as well. And we think it's a bit comparable system at least. Yeah, yeah. And say at other conferences, I've also seen presentations from people who are working say on a similar topic and they also, they have traps and they use photo cameras or you use drones. Are you, say, in contact with other groups or because I think a lot of people are working more or less on similar issues. Yeah, sure, we are in contact. Um, for instance, with one of the coming presentations of the Pima 2 project, I think two presentations from now, we, we had a uh, <coughs> discussion with them just several months ago. And um, yeah, sure, there are many working on that, but as far as I know, they're not using drones. Yeah. And that's a bit the specific of this project, that we want to have this automatically uh, capture the imagery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I've got questions to um, maybe the f for project, maybe more for Uniforce, because it's finished now. So um, you said at the end of uh, your presentation that uh, you would um, disseminate results and again and again and again. Uh, there might be other uh, barriers to the uptake than just the uh, techniques, the knowledge about the techniques. So have you, it, it was not part, it's crystal clear, it was not part of this uh, project to consider the more socio-economic uh, aspects and uh, what could be the other barrier, but are, are you considering, is there any, um, yeah, yeah, um, projects on ongoing 
And uh, one question for this the network would be, the second question would be related to that. Do we need to uh, to foster this kind of uh, interdisciplinary collaboration or it's it's okay so you can manage yourself or do you think that at the EU level we need to uh, yeah, take some initiatives to uh, also link up with these other uh, barriers that can uh, uh, yeah, slow down the uptake of uh, your results? Well, yeah, I think in general, talking about Uniforce and experience in general, like adoption by growers, that there is really mainly a big difference in, yeah, from grower to grower. And you can tell it's okay, there is of course a socio-economic aspect. If it's too expensive, no grower will adopt. But I don't think, well, I can only speak from Flanders from experience, but I think that is very similar in every country. There are some growers who think, okay, I'll give it two years, it can cost some money, we'll see if it works or not. And other growers, you start an experiment, you tell them, okay, we will fund this because it's a first try, we will learn a lot too. You come back a month later, you tell them, okay, you add predatory mites, two weeks later they will come, you add them again. You come back to the grower a month later and he says, oh yeah, I just sprayed the pesticide last week, it didn't look well. This, these things happen and you don't come there. So I think it really is, it depends from grower to grower. Some growers, they don't mind even spending some money to try something and others, even when you kind of try things for free to show them how it works, they don't really care even. So, and then it's a bit the, like we know then out of experience which growers we can try something and which we have to be tougher on, so. But yeah, that's from my experience in Flanders. And uh, say you mentioned the important role of uh, advisory services, then, uh, uh, and who is financing these advisory services? Because I know that, for example, they existed in the Netherlands, but due to budget cuts, they disappeared. Hmm. Well, we also in Belgium, this advisory service that we have, it started within a project. So it was funded, the price was very low. Then for some time there was no funding, so then we had to put rates on it that the grower had to pay a certain amount of money, kind of an hourly cost. Not talking about a phone call, but if we really go to visit them. Then we saw it really drop, much less growers were interested. But some still had, the, like I said before, as some growers don't care about spending a bit extra money, then you can still go there. But we are always looking for solutions for extra funding to keep it more stable and fixed so yeah. every grower can provide. But that's a very tricky thing, so yeah. Yeah, same. Uh, and, uh, I, I just yeah? would like to mention from, from our experience, and uh, by the way, I'm, I'm from Austria and I've been working in with protected crops and beneficials and we introduced it uh, to Austrian growers and it, I, I agree with you, it's up to, to the single grower if he will adopt or not. On the other hand, it's a problem with advisory services that they have to be funded on a private basis nowadays, so the grower have to, grows have to pay. But it was what is also important, how they can market their products and sell their products. And this makes a lot of pressure. So uh, either they are organized uh, somehow or they sell directly to the retailers. Um, they need to fulfill certain standards now, besides all the regulatory uh, standards they have to fulfill with regard to pesticide application. So this uh, also forces sometimes growers to, to adopt these measures and to move somehow. But uh, in the end, it's getting more and more difficult because it's getting more and more expensive for the growers. Yeah. So I think mm. this is the same problem everywhere which yeah. we have. Okay. Well, maybe a question to Hans. Now you have the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> is then, say in your presentation, you indicated that a possible IPM solution can be the use of a biocide. In fact, in combination with pesticide, a, a biocontrol agent, but um, then from a regulatory point of view to get that yeah. altruized. But uh, the antibiofilm compounds we, we looked at are, are not uh, the, the classic uh, biocides, but uh, they can have the benefit that they can be very selective and that could be of uh, a major use and there can be a, a synergistic effect between the use of the biocontrol organism and this antibiofilm compound which can reduce the agrobacterium from the biofilm but it will not affect the BCO in the biofilm. So in this case we can uh, try to develop or increase the BCO content in the biofilm 
And in that mm -hmm. case, we have a more sustainable and a more prolonged uh, effect. And, and maybe in the end, we can uh, get rid of the, the anti-biofilm compound uh, anyway. Yeah. And there's also in tomato cultivation, there is a, a big difference uh, in the treatment during uh, the season and uh, the treatment uh, during crop rotation, where the, the greenhouse is uh, completely uh, cleaned and, and so on. Yeah. So these are two separate approaches. Uh. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. I think uh, um, we have to move to the next session, if, unless there's still a very burning question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> a microbe. <laughs> so, uh, still for you, <laughs> uh, for the bacteria that you mentioned that have uh, activity for the biofilm against the biofilm, could you tell which uh, bacteria you uh, would like to uh, look for? Yeah, well, the, the microorganism. microorganism. The, the BCOs we uh, identified in our group uh, are Pinibacillus strains. Uh, yeah, yeah, Pinibacillus. Um, the other groups also isolated uh, some bacteria, but um, we have to be careful by seeing which once these are at this moment. Okay, oh. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Okay, then uh, thanks to uh, all the presenters, and then I hand over again to Antoine. Yeah, thank, thank you. We can uh, thank you to the speakers, and uh, <laughs> we can. We will uh, squeeze a bit the coffee break. It's for in 30 minutes, so it's fine. So we are five minutes, six minutes late. But uh, before I um, uh, give the floor to Tove Young, that will be chairing the, uh, the session, I just want to, I forgot to tell you that uh, the uh, presentations and the discussions are recorded and will be uh, posted on the website, the CIPM website, after meeting. So I need to, to ask you if you don't want to uh, show up in these uh, uh, videos, uh, please uh, refer to, uh, to law. And if you don't want to, to appear on the, in the discussions, and uh, so that's, uh, I should have put a, a, a sheet of paper somewhere to, uh, to be able to, uh, to express your uh, views on that. So, and the consequence is that you need to use the microphone, even the speaker, so you need to stay uh, closer to these uh, microphones, and of course, whenever we discuss, to use the microphone. So, from is yours, uh, Toby. Thank you. I have now the pleasure to start session two. We will hear two presentations on pest and disease monitoring for IPM. Uh, the first project is uh, called Pest Management Tool for Tomato and Pepper in Europe, and it will be presented by Rani Mertens. Please. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, there must be a mistake. I'm not Rani. She's accompanying me, but uh, I'm Nathalie Brenard. I'm a PhD student from the University of Antwerp, and I'm here on behalf of the project um, Pemato Europep. Oh, no. Okay, so as we all know, uh, monitoring is the basis of uh, IPM, uh, and classical monitoring is uh, done actually only on, on the pests. So we always monitor the pests in the greenhouses, in orchards, in uh, open fields. But less attention is paid on monitoring the beneficials that we release or that come naturally in those systems. Um, and if you want to have uh, accurate pest management, to make accurate pest management decisions, we have to have knowledge on those beneficials that we have in our uh, ecosystems. So it's actually the ratio between the pest and the beneficial that is important and that determines if biological control will be successful in the near future or not. And a better understanding of this full ecological system will improve biological control and will reduce the use of chemicals or the need 
uh, to use chemicals. And the aim of uh, our project is to develop um, an efficient ecological monitoring system, so not just a pest monitoring system, but an ecological monitoring system, and a decision support system for tomato and sweet pepper greenhouses in Europe. Uh, the, fest, the pest species we focus on in this project are the greenhouse whitefly and uh, to, uh, the two spotted spider mites, which are in the top 10 of uh, most problematic pests in greenhouse crops. Then we also have the tobacco, tobacco whitefly, um, which used to be a problem in the south of Europe mostly, but now also shows up in northwestern Europe. And it's a vector of several viruses, causing a lot of economical damage. And then we also take a look at uh, aphids in sweet pepper. They are a common problem there. And biological control is nev uh, never very effective there. And a lot of chemicals are still used. Uh, so we have the pests. And first, we develop an ecological monitoring system to monitor both the pests and their beneficials. And in the next step, we will uh, build population models of those pests and beneficials. In the last step, we will make uh, a concept uh, of a decision support system in which we incorporate the monitoring data and the models and then the predictions made, uh, made with those models. The pests we will uh, monitor with the ecological monitoring system are the spider mite and the two whitefly species. In our monitoring system, we look for standardized and automated <coughs> monitoring. This reduces the time spent monitoring and thus will reduce the costs for growers. The beneficials we will uh, look into are the two generalist predatory mites. We have the Macalophus pygmaeus, which is used in northwestern Europe uh, in tomato greenhouses, also other crops, uh, but we don't work on them in this project. Uh, they are released commercially. Uh, Sold and then released against a number of uh, pests like white flies, aphids, strips, uh, tomato leaf miner, and so on. And then we have the Nesidiochoris, which uh, naturally occurs in southern Europe. It uh, colonizes the greenhouses by itself, and there it preys on white flies and tomato uh, leaf miner. Uh, recently, we also have Nesidiochoris in northwestern Europe. Uh, there it is not beneficial, it is actually a pest uh, because it causes a lot of plant damage by its plant feeding behavior. So also in northwestern Europe now, it's important to be able to monitor these species. Uh, the first ecological monitoring system we are, have been developing is one to <coughs> automatically detect spider mites damage in tomato crops. Uh, this is mainly done by our uh, partner in uh, Wageningen, Wageningen University and Research. Uh, and they actually they build a cart, um, as you see here, you see the, the concept of it, a cart that will slowly drive through the tomato plant rows and we'll take pictures of every plant of the top leaves um, to then uh, detect the damage on those leaves, the damage of the spider mites. Uh, so here you see the concept of the cart, then they've been building it in Wageningen, and they mounted a camera and a laptop on the, on the cart. <coughs> uh, first step was to determine which camera was uh, best to, to use to detect spider mite damage. Uh, good resolution, good illumination, uh, the, the best wavelength to be able to detect it. Um, then they went into the greenhouses in Belgium. They took lots of pictures, more than thousands of pictures, of uh, spider mite damage. They came on several occasions in the same greenhouse to detect the uh, evolution of the damage and also the spread throughout the greenhouse. Uh, on all those pictures, as you see one here, they have to uh, first link them on the right plant and position in the greenhouse and then detect the leaves and the damage on the picture. It has to be manually labeled and then the algorithm can be teached to detect the spider mite damage. This is uh, still going on now. A second ecological monitoring system um, we are working on is the automatic identification and detection of white flies and the predatory bugs. We do that on uh, yellow sticky traps. So again, we have a story of <laughs> sticky traps here. 
Uh, we don't use drones, it's not possible in the greenhouse. Uh, and the way we take standardized pictures in the project is with the scout box from Horticoop. It's always the same illumination, the same distance, same resolution, so your pictures are all exactly the same. Um, and we did it on two systems. Well, originally, it's the greenhouse white fly and macrolophus in tomato, and the tobacco white fly <coughs> and chorus in sweet pepper. But now we also have Nisidiochoris in our greenhouses, and also the tobacco white fly has come up north, so we have to be able to detect them as well. Um, in the first year, one and a half year of the project, we collected lots and lots of pictures from greenhouses in uh, the Netherlands, in Belgium, and in Spain. We have a big database to uh, be able to feed the algorithms enough data. Um, then we all spent some time on manually labeling all those pictures, detecting the white flies, detecting the two species of um, uh, predatory bugs. Uh, and after that, the, they were fed to the algorithms. Uh, detecting the white flies and the predatory bugs works quite well, but um, distinguishing between the two white fly species and the two predatory bug species is still more difficult, but work is still going on there. It, it requires a bit more advanced algorithms. And here you see some preliminary results of those detecting. On the uh, x-axis you see the results from the manual counting, and on the y-axis the results from the deep learning algorithm. For the white fly here it works very nicely. For the macrolophus there's still, still a, a discrepancy between the manual and the algorithm. Uh, aside from monitoring what is already in the greenhouse, we also um, spent some time on uh, expanding the use of Macrolophus pygmaeus in the greenhouses, so not only release it in tomato, but also in sweet pepper. It's common, commonly used everywhere in tomato in northwestern Europe, but not in sweet pepper, although it might <coughs> be a good solution for the problem of aphids there. Uh, so we did some experiments, first on uh, the release in sweet pepper, um, and the first experiments were actually all about food supplementation. Is it required in uh, sweet pepper? And if so, uh, in what fashion and uh, which food type? Um, the first thing we discovered is that full field supplementation is the best, better than local supplementation. It, uh, support, it, it um, resulted in uh, higher populations and also in better dis dispersal in the greenhouse. In a cage experiment, the year after, we, did, uh, we tested three food types, Artemia cis, actually the, the general used food types, Artemia, Ephestia, and a mix of those two, a commercial mix. Mm. And we tested them in, at two application rates, a weekly uh, ap application, as is used in tomato for Macrolophus pygmaeus, and then an uh, application every two weeks. And we found out that in the cage experiment, Artemia which is the cheapest food source, actually resulted in the highest populations. And in a subsequent greenhouse trial, we found the same results. And again, that there's not really a difference between the weekly and the bi-weekly application. So it's sufficient to feed them every two weeks uh, until six weeks after release. Now that we have them in our sweet pepper greenhouse, we kept following them until summer. And we also counted trips. Trips is usually uh, controlled with uh, Aureus, also a predatory bug, um, but one that only feeds on trips, while Macrolophus also has potential on aphids, also feeds on white flies and so on. And we noticed that our Macrolophus population was also perfectly able to control the trips population in both years without the need of releasing extra Aureus bugs. Then we did an experiment on um, control of aphids with Macrolophus, but we checked if it would help the pest control by reducing the, the leaf area index in the greenhouse. So we cut leaves from the base of the plant until a certain foliage length was, uh, was maintained. And um, aphids were released in the greenhouse, also Macrolophus was released at the beginning of the, uh, right after planting, and then we checked the results of the both uh, the aphid populations. And we noticed when no leaf pruning happened, the 
population of the aphids grow exponentially. We had to control them chemically in those plots. Uh, in the first edition of this experiment, the year before, we did not control them. And the populations from the reference plot, they migrated to all the other plots, so it was not, not uh, useful anymore. And here in the other plots, we see that the aphid population stays uh, a lot lower rises a bit, but then is controlled without the need for chemical uh, applications. And we found out that uh, the best length for uh, aphid control is to keep the foliage length at uh, 100, 160 centimeters, which corresponds to an LIE of 4.4. Then after the monitoring and the use of beneficials, we come to the next step, which is the population models. We have three systems that we are modeling. <laughs> The spider mite with the phytocellus, the predatory mite in tomato, and then the tobacco white fly with Misidiochorus from Spain Spanish data in sweet pepper, and then the aphids, peach aphid with Macrolophus in sweet pepper again. Um, the aim is to predict the population density of both the pest and the beneficial for about one or two weeks ahead, and then management decisions can be made based on those predictions. This, the idea is to reduce untimely or unnecessary chemical uh, use of chemicals in the greenhouse. Uh, without <coughs> going in too much detail, I'm also not an expert <laughs> on this part, um, the idea is to use uh, derivatives of Lotka Voltaire, so that's um, oops, prey and predator um, differential equations, they are linked. Um, and it's not the basic theory, but a more expanded one, which is more realistic. Uh, this is the basis, and then the idea is to add also parameters for temperature and so on into those models. Also, other ways of modeling are still are in the <coughs> testing phase to see if they are maybe uh, give better results. <coughs> uh, and then we come to the complete pipeline the, of the decision support system. So we start with uh, monitoring in this case with the sticky traps, then automated identification of pests and beneficials and counting them. Those data are then used for the models, which are vi the, those data are first visualized, of course, and then they, are go they will go into the models, which give uh, predictions to the growers or the crop advisors to say, yes, the, there, there's going to be biological control soon, or no, the beneficial population is too low, pest population too high, you should intervene with chemicals. And the decision support system, we are only making a concept in this project. We do not have the, the means to make a, a website or a tool that will last long. We cannot host, host it on our, any of our servers. Um, but the concept we are making is in our Shiny. It's an open source software. And here you see an example, <coughs> excuse me, an example of the visualization of countings on the sticky traps in the greenhouse, uh, in the, this case the white flies and the macrolophus. And here you see an example of the population um, development with uh, an, a result of the model prediction <coughs> in it as well. So our project still runs for a uh, little less than half a year. Uh, we're still finishing the population models the fine-tuning, the auto-detection of the different whitefly species and predatory bug species, um, and then working on the software tool. Uh, and after the project, we think that our way of, of automatic detection and identification, it can, of course, be used in other crops, not only in sweet pepper and tomato. Um, and it's important for this system that you need standardized pictures. We took them with a scout box, but it's also possible, for example, to take them with a smartphone. We also did some tests on that, but we don't have <coughs> the time to develop it completely. Uh, this should be interesting for growers because it's a lot cheaper, of course. Uh, it can also be used in other systems than greenhouses, for example, in orchards, but apparently there's also <laughs> a project on that already. Um, and then the pipeline, the full pipeline with the monitoring, the visualization, the population models and the predictions. Um, it should be interesting if, uh, if it's implemented in commercial software uh, by companies who, well, who are in, uh, into biological control and uh, everything.
Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. Are there any quick questions now? Then you can spare them for, for the discussion after the session. Thank you very much. We will go on to the next speaker. Uh, IT solutions for user-friendly IPM tools in the management of leaf spot diseases in cereals, spot IT project, and it will be presented, I hope I'm correct this time, Berit Nordskog from Norway, from Nibio. Please. Yeah, thank you. So this project is a Nordic Baltic initiative. We have participants from Norway, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, and Lithuania. So I'll start with the background and then get more into detail on the project. See. So we are focusing on leaf diseases, and specifically in wheat and barley, the leaf spots that are threatening those crops. And we also look at how this is affected by the use of fungicides and how widely, or the use of fungicides that are widely used in this uh, region, the Nordic Baltic region, to, to manage these diseases. And uh, there is disease thresholds and disease risk funnels that are important parts of IPM for the farmers to actually help them decide on when to start spraying or if they should spray at all. Uh, however, the models that exist are all in need of improvements and, and we all have, we have several different models which all could be better. And I think that the main part and idea of this project was to get together and look at these models overall and see how, can we select one model, can we select parts of these models to actually uh, make something that's better for all of these participants, uh, farmers in all of these countries. Um, so one of the starting points that we had is that in Norway we have a decision support system that's called BIPS. And that has been recently implemented on an open source technology platform. So we have since 2001 developed a system to fit the Norwegian use and new uh, basically what the advisory service and what the farmers in Norway need. And it covers a lot of different crops. There are different pests and diseases based on what we have to deal with in Norway. But the idea with having this open source technology platform is that we wanted to open for international collaboration and that also that others can use the models that are available in the system or if they would like to use the system as a server or a platform they can implement other models. So the main objectives is to use the benefits of uh, uh, such a transnational technology platform with a locally adapted IT tools to facilitate better implementation of IPM practices in the serial production. And kind of the sub-objectives of this is to characterize the end user groups. We need to know who wants to use this and how we can meet them and also to understand the motives behind the farmer decision making so that uh, in relation to the IPM tools so we can optimize this in the way that they actually need. And then we have to improve and validate the risk prediction models um, based on both field observations and also historical data. And finally to develop the IPM tools that are needed and accommodate those to the local user needs. So <coughs> basically we have to investigate what is needed in each of the different countries and so regions of the different countries so that we don't produce one system that to fit all uh, or maybe nobody but to fit something that everybody would like to use in different ma ways maybe. So this is the workflow of this project and uh, as you can see we have the farmer and advisors in the center. They are the main core of what we're doing and how we are thinking in this project and then we have the work package one, where we look at the farmer preferences and user needs um, with surveys and looking into how their kind of modes of action are, basically. Um, 
we do look at the models, use weather data, field data to do the model validation and field trials. And also then uh, VIPs would be, okay, this was kind of working all the time. Oh, I see. Um, so we use VIPs in the testing and then for, um, for kind of the project duration, we use VIPs as a testing uh, system. And then after that, the models that are implemented and adapted in the VIP system can be used also in the local systems in each of the countries so that you don't have to buy access to VIPs to use this in general. Then you don't have to all kind of enter the same website, basically. I'll get back to that. Okay, now I'm... Okay, so uh, in the first work package, looking at the user needs, um, we have some uh, surveys actually on its way out now. They would send it out in Sweden this week, and all other countries would use all the same packages of questions, but we also have some preliminary surveys that was done in Lithuania and some uh, focus group interviews that has been done in some of the other countries. And some of the results that came out of the questions that were used in uh, Lithuania uh, last summer were basically, uh, I just kind of collected a couple of ones now, but where do you get advice and knowledge about pests and pesticides? And basically, the, it's quite diverse, but it's from the agricultural advisory, but also you ask other farmers, and you ask your family, you read journals, and you talk to the dealers of the pesticides, of course. And that's a very important part where they get information. So the interesting thing here is that when you ask what are the factors affecting decisions about fungicide use at your farm, um, well, the previous experience with fungicides, weather conditions, and occurrence of plant diseases in the field is, of course, important. Unfortunately, when you come to advice from decision support systems, it's not that kind of high as you would like. So that's where we have to work. And um, basically, this is just to show that how much do you agree with the following statements? And decision support is complicated to use. And quite a few say that that is, they totally agree in that it's difficult to use. So this is only 105 farmers in Lithuania. And it will be very interesting to see how the feedback will be from the other countries too, because it can, it's most likely quite big difference between different countries. Uh, but this is something for us to take into account when we keep working in this project. So in work package two, we selected um, the models available in, in the Nordic Baltic regions. So basically this is an overview. And two of the models were um, uh, selected for further use based on some validation with um, historical data. And um, so we have two models in wheat and two in barley that are testing in field trials. So we have collected lots of old data to do comparisons and analysis. And then in this season, we had 33 field trials. And of course, it was very dry all over the place. So um, only three of those 33 actually had recommendations for spraying. And still, we can see and, and look into whether that is relevant or correct for all of them or not. But we hope for some rain or some variable weather conditions next year. So hopefully, <laughs> that's going to be more uh, um, diverse in the results. And we're also looking at yield loss and, of course, early, how yield loss and early disease records can be compared, because that's very important how we can produce the models in a good way. So for the IT solutions, uh, two models have been implemented in VIPs. We have a server set up for testing in this project. The output currently is something like this, where you see graphs, where you get the output and details from, uh, from what the models give. So this is used only for research purposes now. And then we have been playing with what can you actually do? 
how can the output be made? So we made uh, a solution that's easy integration for any website. You basically just kind of have some short piece of code that you can implement in your website, and then you can get map looking sort of like this. This is showing uh, forecast or risk of disease based on uh, weather stations, but you can also make gridded maps. And this is made of gridded data from weather forecasts provided by NorwegianYR.no, which is totally free and available to all. So it's very easy and low cost to use, which is good. So it's actually the Norwegian Met Office and the Norwegian Broadcasting Company that's behind that. So uh, perspectives for implementation and user models. Uh, this is a more on a wider scale, basically when whatever crop or pest you're working with. The farmer, he wants to plan ahead. If it's going to rain tomorrow, he needs to know if he has to spray today or if he can wait until it dries up again. <laughs> and he needs field relevant data and he needs easy access to model outputs in a way that he can understand. While the researcher wants to have an accurate model, uh, usually we use site-specific data and site-specific weather data when we develop a model. And one of the things that we need to look at is how robust is a model that you develop based on those site-specific spe data when you have to use less accurate input data later on. Especially if the field is located far away from the weather station, it will be less accurate or if the weather station is not very accurate. So the weather data providers, they care about resolution and time and space. What can they actually provide? How far down to the field level or kind of local, local level can you go? And which parameters can they actually provide? Do we make models that provide, um, need parameters that cannot be provided through the gridded data or the weather forecast? That makes it difficult if you want to use this uh, model in different aspects with different input data later on. And also the data accuracy and data quality. It's always fun to be in meetings with um, meteorologists where you ask them to provide you hourly data of leaf wetness um, seven days ahead of time. They don't produce leaf wetness data. Um, and we need at least to have the background data to ca calculate leaf wetness. So, so you kind of achieve quite high inaccuracy if you start building up on all of these things. And that's something that you have to deal with when you're looking into the model too. So basically the long-term perspectives in this is that we need to make sure that we understand what the farmers and advisors need and how they envision that this could be used in practice and how much are they willing to pay and who's going to keep things up to date every day, make sure that it all works. So we have to have systems that work locally. And uh, also, we have to make sure that it works with the systems where they're used to finding information. We don't want to um, provide them in, with lots of different new websites or new solutions, but if we can provide them with, this is the website you usually do, and you find this information as an addition to that. That, that's basically what we're going for. And then some places that's easy to do, other places not that easy. So, so the final results in this project is going to be a little bit of, of both, basically. We are quite a big group of people working in this project with uh, people from Nibio in Norway, Aarhus University and Copenhagen University in Denmark, and LAMS in Lithuania, which is the Lithuanian Institute of Agricultural Research. Is that right? We have two people here from Lams, so they have to correct me. Uh, we are Luke in Finland <coughs> and SLU in Sweden. And very important, we have subcontracts with advisory services in all of the participating countries. And we use them. Um, we invite advisors that are represented into our meetings so that they actually can give input throughout the whole project. So this is the crew that had a meeting at Lillehammer this uh, summer. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Are there quick questions now? Or are you longing for the coffee break? <laughs> 
We will come back to the questions after the next part of the sessions. Thank you very much.